Welcome to the Dead Prophet Show. I'm Mike Beckett, your host. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome back Paul Morelli, uh, who was on the show uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about what evangelism was, and uh, I believe the show released on Easter, specifically on Easter, purposefully on Easter. Uh, so, the, so that was uh, awesome. And um, if you haven't had a chance to check out the uh, first video, uh, definitely go back in there and check it out on the website. It is uh, a phenomenal Q&A back and forth about evangelism. And I know, Paul, you you know your stuff. You've been doing this for 50 plus years, uh, uh, like you said last time. And um, it is always, always uh, great to talk about evangelism and talk about the, the what it is, how we do that, why we don't do that, those sorts of things. Um, you know, sometimes for me, it's just uh, I'm, <laughs> it depends on humanity and what mood humanity puts me in that I have to go back to repent because I'm mad because I had to deal with humans. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you get in that that mindset. I'll never forget. I have uh, colleagues of mine that are in ministry and pastoring and like, so why didn't you ever pastor? And, you know, I, I felt called into teaching and education, but I always like to joke with them. I say, well, if it wasn't for the people, I'd pastor, you know, <laughs> uh, even though that is kind of like, ah, you don't want to say that. There, there's a truth to that because people can be very difficult. Um, people can be very challenging, especially when in today's culture, when we try to push the, um, you know, biblical truths, the biblical worldview uh, that we have and and support that in a obviously non-Christian uh, America, where, you know, anything goes, um, you know, as long as you're not forcing biblical truths down my throat, you know, you can force any other thing down anybody else's <laughs> throat. But if you stand for biblical truth and just say, no, I don't, I'm not going to do that. You know, it's like culture comes against you. So yeah, there, there are times I, I sit back and I think, man, I, I, I like being a homebody every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> like sitting in the middle of my woods, uh, but uh, but the reality is, you know, we we are we are called to evangelize and and to uh, reach the world. I mean, I go back to uh, Jesus when he was, you know, giving the uh, eleven disciples there the, the great commission, and he says, "Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you." Uh, and then he tells us, "Behold, I am uh, with you always, uh, even to the end of the age." I mean go and make disciples is to go and evangelize. I mean, that's, that's really it. I mean, it, it, there's no clear um, instruction to, of, uh, of what Jesus says, then to you go evangelize, go tell them, go disciple them, uh, baptizing them in the name of the father, son, and Holy spirit, uh, tell them this good news. And um, I know uh, you, you have uh, done some teaching and, um, put some uh you know sermons together and things of that nature from uh Mark uh Middleberg's contagious faith and I know we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit today and you know as far as you know why we're going to evangelize I know we're going to talk about the different styles and and, and so forth uh but uh, I'm going to you know stop chatting uh and and wasting my <laughs> wasting the air because you've got a lot of good things to talk about today uh so I'm just going to turn it over to you and we'll kind of go uh go with that Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Um, I just actually last night finished up a six week uh, series teaching this exact stuff. And it was uh, six and one hour sessions. And I'm sure we've got about maybe a sixth of that time. And so I'm going to leave a lot of stuff out, but it's good stuff. Um, well, feel free, feel free if you want to elaborate more. I mean, like I, I've said before, we just keep going uh, with okay. this and we just pick up where we left off last time. I mean, you, you've, you, 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 you are definitely a popular um, uh, guest <laughs> on my show. I went back this week. I mean, we it was only Easter it was only a you know a few days ago, and and I've looked back and you've like exploded beyond all the most views that I've had so far. So it's awesome. I mean, this is stuff people want to hear. I mean, you're connected with people who really desire to to want to know this stuff. So I mean, don't feel like you have to rush through it. If uh, we get to that the time that the this one's out, we'll come back and we'll we'll just pick up where we left off. So. Definitely have had the liberty to uh, share with us what's uh, on your heart and and what you've been sharing with others. Okay, we'll we'll do that. We'll 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 do a shell, and uh, you take notes if there's something you want to expand on. Um, we can do that later. Uh, but, but I'll. I mean, one of the first things I want to cover, and I just actually saw this on a post today, uh, is that we're called to disciple, not convert. And I disagree with that because, as we said in the first one. I believe all people are spiritually dead at birth. They're, they're born that way. And until they become 
spiritually alive, you can't disciple a dead person. You know, so so conversion, as I've said in the past video, is the starting point of discipleship. They're not separate, but they're two distinct time points. You get converted, and then from there you grow, and then hopefully you lead to conversion of other people through that process. So um, evangelism to me is the starting point. And uh, um, when I teach uh, evangelism, which Ephesians 4 talks about evangelists equipping the people of God, I have a fairly simple goal, and it's that in everything I teach, I hope each person, especially laity, can grab onto one thing and say, I can do that. Um, I'm going to talk about six different styles that come out of uh, Mark Middleberg's book, uh, actually the older book, Becoming a Contagious Christian. And uh, I, I uh, started opening up that teaching with uh, a little song by Kenny Rogers. It's kind of a cute song, and it's called Pitched Like That. And uh, so about a little boy goes out to the park, and he, he throws up a ball, and he swings, and he misses, and he swings three times. And he goes home saying how good he was. And his mother says, what do you mean? He says, I didn't even know I could pitch like that. Yeah. <laughs> not, not everybody <laughs> is a batter. Some people are pitchers. And uh, in evangelism, it's that same thing. There's there's different styles that God has wired us and, and put us in different situations. And my goal is that somehow you can grab hold of one thing and say, I can do that. That's something mm -hmm. I can do. So, um I talked last time about starting with why, because without why, we have no motivation. And uh, as I uh, alluded to there before was that the Bible teaches we are not born spiritually dead because of what we do, but because of who we are. We're born out of Adam, and we bring that spiritual death from Adam into us. Hebrews talks about that very clearly. Uh, the Bible says uh, in Isaiah and also Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, A-L-L, -L, no one's left out. Uh, it's original sin is what we call it. Uh, universalism disagrees with that, but yeah. the Christian Bible talks pretty clearly about the fact that we are spiritually broken people. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So if everybody's a sinner and everybody who sins is dead, then we're all in the same predicament. Uh, the message says it, uh, we're all in the same sinking boat together. I love the way it says that. Mm -hmm. uh, but Romans 6.23 doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, at that point, I get a lot of people say, yeah, but I'm pretty bad. I'm, I'm too bad. And Romans 5.8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't, we don't have to get good enough. I run into that a lot. Person says, I have to get good enough to become a Christian. And uh, you can't get good enough to become a Christian. You have to trust Christ to make you better. And and so while you were yet totally worthless to him, the message says, he reached out and saved you. The Apostle Paul talks about that kind of thing. I was the worst of people, and I killed Christians, and, and yet Jesus had mercy on me. And then Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so you, in faith, you step out and accept the truth. And again, John three sixteen, as most people know, uh, God loved the world so much, everyone so much, that he sent Jesus his son, to die in their place, to, to make an atoning death. And uh, in through that, uh, no one has to perish or uh, miss out on eternal life. And so yeah. that's the why. And somehow we have to uh, wrap our head around that. There's a universal problem with a universal solution, and it's the same solution for everybody, and it's free, so everybody can have it. Yeah. Um, so You know, I like, I like, I like Paul. Uh, I like a lot of his writings. I was just talking about... Uh, in in my uh, I just finished chapter six this past week uh, for my for my book with Sardis and um, you know I, I talked about you know Paul was just very you know he he was he he killed uh, Christians uh, in the beginning uh, and then God used him to reach the whole Gentile population uh, but it's interesting you know I brought back to the whole point uh, of where Paul talks about you know the things I want to do I don't and the thing I don't want to do I do. Just giving the reality of Paul's human, and and I know we talked about this last time. It's that it's that when we get to that conversion point, it's then the growing forward. I, I think a lot of times we feel when we convert, and and I know when I got saved the very first time, I was just like this superpower. I was ready to overturn trees and convert plants and animals. I mean, I was just <laughs> boom. That's where I was. Um, 
but but then you know you, reality kicks in and you start to realize that I would say that honeymoon time wears off, but to some degree because then you realize you know I, I am I'm still human I'm not superhuman and and I struggle with things and uh, I struggle with anger or I struggle with this and uh, you know and and Paul just just is real with us in the scriptures you know uh, the perfection isn't here we're not mm-hmm. going to hit that perfection here you know a lot of people in the charismatic movement uh or or people in my some of my pentecostal circles that i'm friends with they all talk about well, as they pray for people to well we we speak to the body and we declare that you line up and blah blah and they go on with this list and then they talk about we need to be walking in our divine health well no you're not you're not in your heavenly body you can't walk in divine <laughs> anything because you're not in there we're we're human frail bodies that are born into sin and but i really like paul's writings in the new testament and i've gotten to appreciate the more i think that i've been doing more of this study uh for this book is just the the realness of look this is what our goal is we're to reach for this prize but we're going to be human and we're going to fail mm-hmm. we're going to fail at times drastically but but here's what we do we don't we don't throw the talent we keep moving toward that goal and keep trying to develop and grow in that relationship with Christ, obviously repenting along the way. But I just find that so fascinating. So when you mentioned that, I, I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate how Paul is just, and you you brought it out just so well in what you were explaining, just the realness of, 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 of who he is and the encouragement that he brings to believers through the New Testament. It didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, I just no, wanted to right. share that. No, um, that's that's good because, um, you know, Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read it, I think yeah. Bunyan was the author. Mm-hmm. Uh, talks about that. Uh, they start out on a path and it looks like you start here and you go straight to heaven. And yet Pilgrim's uh, life was full of ups and downs and mistakes and things. And yeah. and uh, I think the best thing I ever saw that talked about that was a cartoon. I don't think I remember that, mentioned this last time, but it, it showed uh, two stick figures starting here when a person comes alongside Jesus and heaven's up here. And as they're walking up this straight line, there's a road to the right. And the, the pilgrim says, uh, I think we should go down that road. And Jesus says, no, that's that's not a good road. Oh, yeah, it is. And then a little while later, you see the guy coming back, the stick figure with his head down, dejected. And he gets to the intersection, and Jesus is there with a campfire and says, you ready to go again? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's you know, pretty neat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it, you can go down that road. I, I can't encourage you, but I'm here when you're ready to get back. Let's go yeah. again. And yeah. yeah, so I don't believe in, I, I know Wesley talked about um, sinless perfection in this life, but it's not what most people think it is. Um, we strive uh, for perfection, but this body, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life uh, attack us. That's the three that got Eve and it yeah. attacks us on a regular basis. And, and, and I think yeah. scripture is pretty evident uh, that, um, uh, you you can't this side of eternity in several different places and several different scriptures uh, you know live a a sin free life you know sometimes when i hear pastors preaching well i i don't struggle with sin i'm thinking well you're a heretic because that's not reality <laughs> you mean you never get angry you, you 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 know especially if they're young men you never lust after a woman you never do any of these other things you don't you don't ever think of you know whatever but you know all, all the list of sins that paul gives us and there's several of them you know when i hear people say well well i don't sin I, i'm you're not above <laughs> that you're not jesus christ uh you know you're mm-hmm. still in humanity so I, I agree with you there yeah totally yeah. Yeah, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 uh, says that you can't earn salvation. It's a gift. Uh, nobody gets there by being good enough. And uh, I think the best I've ever heard that illustrated was uh, uh, there's a little clip on uh, YouTube by Alistair Begg, and it's called uh, The Man in the Middle Cross. And uh, uh, basically, he talks about the, the man uh, that turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me. And uh, he kind of jokes about it. He says, uh, can you imagine uh, that man shows up at heaven's gate? And uh, uh, in keeping with evangelism explosions, questions, uh, you know, well, why are you here? Why should I let you into my heaven? And and the man says, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, when push comes to shove and they said, why, why do you think you should be here? And he just says, the man in the middle cross said I could come. And uh, Alistair, Alistair Begg goes on to say that anything other than that, and we either become very, very egotistical and arrogant, or mm-hmm. we become depressed and hopeless, one of the two. Uh, if it's about what we can do or will do, we're in trouble. 
and uh, or we're arrogant, one of the two. So and it's um, a shame because we see that arrogance part throughout our churches, and and really the the issue of what's tearing Methodism apart today. I had just jumped on Facebook page and. Um, there was something on there where they had uh, talked about uh, a church in, in in Georgia that basically came in and uh, declared whatever the law is in their book of discipline. Uh, you know what? We're shutting this. This church is ours now. You go somewhere else. And I had made a comment that, you know, it's, it's a shame that because bishops and le- people in leadership uh, got very proud and thought they were above the law. Uh, that they could do whatever they want, but yet they come back and use the law in in the negative approach. You know, we're we're not going to deal with the, the book of discipline. We're not going to talk about things because they're culturally uh, not. We, we that would cause us to separate ourselves from from the culture and actually stand out and be Jesus Christ. You know, and 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 a true Christian. We're we're going to just you know bypass those, not hold each other accountable. Ah, but when we can use the book of discipline to make those who want to live a holy life uh, look smaller and and we can use our authority and that arrogance comes back to to, to in a different way. And I, and I just I, I I pray for those people because, you know, unless there's a repentant heart, they stand before God. Uh, it's going to be that, you know, get away from me, you wicked, uh, you doers of iniquity. I, I never knew you because the, the heart of the issue isn't isn't the the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. And um, the. The one thing that um, through this whole thing that bothers me the most uh, is is a misunderstanding of the church. Uh, the church is the people. Jesus didn't die for buildings; he died for people. Right. And the no one can hold a church back from anything. Yeah. Uh, they can take the assets, the building. But that's not the church. Those are right. tools that enable the church to do ministry, keep mm-hmm. us warm, dry, cool, uh, place to put things. But the church is the people, and the yep. church uh, has the freedom to follow Christ, whatever it takes. China's a good example of that. Yeah. Uh, it's a country of house churches yep. uh, that have chosen to do without what we would call necessary facilities in order. Mm-hmm. And, and they've grown uh, unbelievable. About, they figure somewhere around 200 million Christians mm. um, with with nothing but uh, lay leadership and uh, house churches. So And persecution uh, knocking on their yeah, door every persecution, day. persecution, right. Yep. So, so, yeah, so I just, sometimes we get caught up too much fighting about assets. And, I, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I know people have sacrificed to provide those assets. I know that it's hard to start over and have a place to meet, but, but it's not the end of the world. That's right. just somehow people have to get a hold of that. The church is yeah. the people and the church. Mm-hmm. So, um, so as, as we look at evangelism, I guess one other illustration I'd like to throw out under the why before we go into the, uh, the how would be, um, I tell people to imagine that, uh, uh, you, you're on death row. Uh, you've committed treason. Uh, it's punishable by death. You deserve it. You did it. Um, and 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 uh, your friends, maybe the church brings you in some clothes, and you would thank them. And you know it's chilly in there, and maybe some food that you liked, or uh, something to read, or whatever. And and you would be happy. But what do you really want? You're on death row. You want a pardon. That's what you want. You want the phone to ring and the you know the warden to pick it up and they say, let that man go free. And and that's the message we have. We have the pardon that God has given to us and said it's free, give it out to whoever will accept it. So somehow we have to get that why in our heads, I think, to the point that uh uh it will start to sink into our souls and start coming out our mouth. Uh, right. That also is another thing is that uh, the fact that the gospel, uh, evangelism is messenger of good news and gospel mm-hmm. means good news. And the concept of messenger implies that it's a uh, message that has been presented either by speaking or by writing. So I think we have to keep that in our uh, our mind too, is that we have a message that needs to be uh, given through culture and given out. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I've got the six styles that I typically teach. I can go into them now if you'd like and yeah, please. talk about yeah. them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, these these come out of contagious uh, becoming a contagious Christian by uh, Mark Middleberg. If you get the study guide, there's an assessment in there you can take to find out how God's wired you to do this. Which one of these six styles is your style? Uh, basically, he suggests that the the first one's relational, and that's uh, Matthew in Matthew chapter nine. 
uh, we call it party with a purpose. Uh, Matthew, after he met Jesus, had Jesus come over and had a party with all of his tax collector friends and and uh, said, hey, you know, this this guy's got something you need to hear. Oh. And, and so that's a powerful style because people are relational by nature. The gospel is relational. And when our relationship is restored with the creator through the gospel, we want others to be in that relationship with us. And so it's a powerful style. Um it's a fun style too. I think I mentioned last time about uh, we have uh, a group that meets. We call it the Fellowship of the Pizza Oven, and friend has a wood fired pizza oven, and uh, we've had uh, over fifty people come through it in two years, and uh, it's, you know free pizza and you eat and we talk. We go through a chapter of the Bible and we get to meet Jesus, you know, and it, it's 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 a powerful style. Um, the uh, the next style would be uh, serving. Um, and that would be Tabitha or Dorcas in Acts chapter 9. Uh, she had died. Peter came to town, and all the widows held up clothes and said, look look what she did for us in Christ's name, you know. And and I believe they believed because of her serving. Now, the dangers, every every style has a danger associated with it also. Um, the relational is that you party, but instead of having party with a purpose, you just party. <laughs> you, you forget the purpose, okay? And uh, serving is the same thing. We can do a lot of good works. I quoted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, Ephesians 10 goes on to say, after it talks about the free gift, that we need to step into the opportunities to do good works that God has created for us that accepted that gift. So uh, serving is a good thing, but Somehow we have to learn if we're wired for serving to bring in the message somehow, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's a weakness we have. The message implies a spoken or written message, and we're just ambassadors, humble ambassadors of the king of the universe. Um, the next style would be uh, um, testimonial. And that would be John chapter 9, the blind man, Jesus restored his sight. And they ask what happened. He says, I don't know. I was blind and now I see. And I told, I gave my testimony, I think, last time. Is I was an atheist. Uh, I went to an evangelistic meeting um, and I trusted Christ and now I can see. I'm spiritually alive. I was spiritually dead. And you went, and you went there alive. to cause trouble. You went there to challenge him. <laughs> right. And Jesus yeah. and, turned that whole thing around. And, well, I, the Apostle Paul's my hero. I mean, mm -hmm. he. He was killing Christians, breaking up groups, putting people in prison. And next thing you know, he wrote half the New Testament. And, you know, and, and he's just telling everybody, you yeah, know, that was me before. That's not me now. And that's yeah. that's my and, and that's part of the testimonial style, too, is I can give you the Apostle Paul's testimony. I can give you uh, a dozen people I know, my uh, one of my best friends, Rich. Uh, I can give you his testimony. The testimonies are powerful because I can give you facts and you can argue against them. But when somebody gives you a testimony of what happened to them that's hard to argue against it's hard mm -hmm. to tell them they didn't experience that so right. uh, there's power in testimonies um intellectual this would be uh act 17 uh paul at the aragapis or uh, mars hill where he talks to the uh, philosophers of the day and then says hey i see that you're religious you uh, worship an unknown god let me tell you about the god that you worship in ignorance and goes on to give them the gospel. Um, um, it's interesting that you know, the apostle Paul, one of the greatest apologists of all times, when he was done and he mentioned the resurrection from the dead, some of them scoffed and walked away. And I say that because uh, one of the things we have to be comfortable with is we don't control the outcome. We have to let the outcome go. It says some believed though and followed Paul. So um, we have to be comfortable with not, seeking earthly success not everybody's going to trust christ uh the stats are one in a hundred that you speak to so don't get discouraged uh, ezekiel uh, god told him nobody's going to listen but keep preaching anyway so uh, just keep doing the right thing and the results they're up to god don't worry about that part um the next style is uh um direct or hey let me back up uh two on, on the intellectual or apologetic uh, apologetics is a word that means to uh, defend the faith. And uh, we have some really impressive apologists uh, right now. Um, R Gregory Kokel uh, wrote a book called The Story of Reality. He has an organization, Stand to Reason, and uh, is helping people learn how to do apologetics very powerfully. Uh, Carl Truman, uh, 
wrote a book, Strange New World, where he talks about this upside down culture around us and and why it is and where it came from and how do we deal deal with it and stuff. Uh, Os Guinness, uh, his books um, are very deep, very philosophical, sometimes hard to understand, but he has a grasp of the real deep problems, not the surface issues, very mm-hmm. much like Carl Truman's talking. And then one of the latest ones I've run into is uh, Dr. James Tour. Uh, he's a um, synthetic organic chemist and does nano engineering. He works at molecular level building machines uh, for a living. And he's a uh, messianic Jew. Okay. And uh, he's, he's one of the most powerful scientific apologist i have ever seen Hmm. not embarrassed of his faith uh will take very strong stands and won't back down um he opens himself up for critique by his fellow scientists and said show me where i'm wrong you know so um if if you want to follow those people if that's your style man there's some good people to help you Mm -hmm. work through it Mm -hmm. um the next style is uh direct or confrontational uh, and this would be Peter in Acts on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Peter, who denied Christ, now all of a sudden is standing uh, in the middle of a huge crowd and s- preaches a three-minute and 25-second message. I, I've actually preached the words to see how long it take, and that's about how long. And 3,000 people respond to it. And everybody says you have to build relationships and be friends. Well, you read that that speech. He was in their face. You guys have killed the Christ, and you're in deep doo doo, you know. And they cry out, "What must we do to be <laughs> saved?" You know. I mean, you know, it's just some people need that shock and awe, and yeah. uh, uh, and and some of us are gifted that way. Uh, the the weak side of this style is that we can tend to argue and debate, and you can't debate people into the faith. So somebody asked me one time a question, and I asked somebody smarter than me, how should I answer that? And rather than give me the answer to give to them, they said, ask this question back. If I could answer that question to your satisfaction, would you trust Christ? And if they say, yeah, this has kept me from the faith for a long time, then, well, let's work on that. And if they say, well, not really, then they're just deflecting. Don't waste your time. You know, it's you're not going to get anywhere with it. So um, uh, if you're, if you're this kind, if you're a direct person or confrontational, uh, make sure the person is open to hearing and you're not just, uh, I, I guess, I guess I've heard that we can, we can win the argument and lose the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, Os Guinness and C.S. Lewis often talked about that. Sometimes you don't have to win every argument. Sometimes the person is more important than the argument. So yeah. um, that, that's where we have to watch that. And then the last one is uh, probably, it's not the one I'm gifted the highest in, but it's the one that's my favorite. And that's the invitational style. And that's the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, the Chosen uh, has a little clip uh, that shows this, that that just will rip your heart out. It's so powerful. But the, the Samaritan woman didn't go off and get a degree in theology. She didn't, uh, you know, go to Bible studies. She ran into town and said, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Can this be the Christ? Mm-hmm. Um, I've since read that tradition says that she went on to be an evangelist and uh, a martyr eventually because she wouldn't quit telling people about Jesus. Mm-hmm. A powerful woman of faith that came because Jesus took time to talk to somebody who was culturally rejected in society. And, and it's and interesting she because she invited others. It's interesting because the Samaritans had a totally different perspective of what their Messiah would be. And, and their style of worship was totally different than their Jewish counterparts. Uh, and it, it is just, inter- that's interesting uh, because, um, wow, I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, people, people who are saved, um on the outskirts or the rejects jesus said those who are forgiven much love much and it seems to be that most people who step into evangelism as a calling are somebody who has experienced it so powerfully that they just can't keep their mouth shut Mm -hmm. and the samaritan woman seems to have been that kind of person and again if, if you watch that clip it's fascinating the way they portrayed that um so i i want to all these styles are there's nothing magical about them but god has made us unique and we have personalities and gifts and if you take that assessment you'll find that you're probably strong in one maybe two occasionally i find somebody who's strong in all six styles Hmm. and i usually tell people i believe 
that's a gifting or a calling to be an evangelist because that person can move almost effortlessly across the six styles for whatever the situation requires. They mm-hmm. can, they can be relational. They can be invitational. They can be, uh, they can say the hard stuff that needs done. They can defend the faith. They yeah. can give their testimony. You know, you see what I'm saying? They can, they can. So if, if you take that assessment, just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're listening to this, uh, talk to somebody about a possible call to evangelism. Yeah. Uh, we need a lot of evangelists and uh, well, lay evangelists, it, I believe. It just, uh, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of, taken back here i'm just uh, my mind's going with that samaritan woman and uh so uh what we'll do is we'll just take a quick break here and we'll go ahead and um watch that scene here with us so we'll go ahead and watch that scene we'll be right right back Give me a drink. Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, would you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? And a woman? I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come with you in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water? Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. (laughs) Ha ha ha. I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. 
but it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank Him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit, and the time is coming and is now here that it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> You forgot your um. Well, I, I hope that uh, that had the impression on you like it did me because it brought me to tears. I think it's probably the most powerful dramatic presentation of what changed in her heart that made her go from being a rejected person to somebody who invited people to meet the messiah so yeah um, coming in uh, coming into contact and power with with the one who created you i think is is yeah. is is key i mean yeah. you're having a conversation with god right there i mean yeah. changes your yeah. changes your whole dynamic of life whole outlook of life so and and the heart of god comes out in that conversation so powerfully that it can't help but move you so and and and, and part of that 
again, Christianity is not a religion of rules. Uh, I was reading uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, reading through some of the documents. And uh, if you belong to the Essenes or several other of the um, groups or monasteries, and you read what you had to do and how easily you could be removed from the group or put in jail for seven years for doing something. I mean, it would be exhausting just to think about how to live without. And and we're free from that. You know, there, there's a freedom because we are now in a relationship. You don't get up in the morning thinking, OK, I've got to follow all these rules so that my wife will be happy with me. You know, no, I love my wife and I do things because I love her and she does things because and and, and that's how the relationship with Jesus is meant to be. So um, one of the things I want to before we move on to uh, why we don't what holds us back from evangelism uh, is um, that the message is central. The good news of the gospel is central to Christianity. It's not just a side part. And uh, Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. I think the message says it's sharper than a surgeon's scalpel. And uh, um, don't be afraid. Uh, there are several people who make uh, uh, New Testaments in versions like the New Living Translation or something that's easy to understand. Don't be afraid to just give it to them if they're skeptical and say, hey, Read it for yourself. I mean, don't listen to me. You read it and you tell me what you think. You know, we'll get back together next week or, you know, read the book of John or read, uh, you know, whatever. And and uh, let it speak for itself because uh, the word of God has power and and can can change people. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of uh, Muslims being changed by just reading the scriptures and stuff. So, but and what holds us? I'm sorry. I was saying, and and it's 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 key the the centrality of of the whole Christian message is is you know what what happens with Jesus what do we do with him, um I know uh, I I've taught religions classes and and world history classes and you teach on other religions and and I um will always preface students whenever I get to the Christianity unit and they incorporate Jehovah's Witnesses Seventh Day Adventists and um uh the Mormons into Christianity. And I will say I have to disagree with your author here because the definitive um, the theology behind uh, what determines Christianity from all of these other religions is what do they do with Jesus? Mm. Where wh Who is Jesus? Where does he fit in the in the theology? And we get Jesus Christ and him crucified, his blood shed for for us, period. It's he's not just some other prophet. He's not just some other voice coming in. He's not, you know, one of many voices that we should listen to. He is the only voice that we should listen to and should follow. Uh, and, and I think that's really key that you said that is, you know, the centrality of the Christian message behind who Jesus is, what he did for us, uh, the salvation that we have through him and him alone, where you have these other ones, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Mormons and and Seventh Day Adventists, and and we the list can go on of of um, Christian type religions that you know historians will lump together, but mm. the historians forget to realize that the 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 reality is 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 the Jesus component. I remember when I taught high school back in back in the day, uh, and I taught AP World History, and one of the 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 earlier debates we would have because we'd start out with history with all the different creation stories, you know. Uh, Egyptians creation story, uh, you know, where one barfs up the other God, uh, you had the uh, another perspective, which bases out of Hinduism, where one clot of blood becomes a God, you know, uh, but I would, we would have a debate and the debate would be, uh, along the lines of creationism versus, uh, evolutionism. And can we ever bridge the gap? And, um, It'd be interesting because I was in a fairly religious area, the Bible Belt area of 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 the country of the country, and you know they'd sit there and they would talk and they'd go back and forth and back and forth. But it would I, I'd usually somebody eventually at the end would say, "Well, they're never going to bridge because evolution's never going to accept the reality that Jesus Christ is." is the 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 savior of our of our of our souls that that the creation god created it and it's through jesus christ that we have uh, have have everything it's like they they would always pinpoint the creationism 
at the end back to the cross. And, and that was the key uh, is, is the reality is God created the world. Mm-hmm. Jesus uh, died for our sins. That's the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and evolution won't see the true reality because they're stooped up into the scientific method there. They want proof. They want, uh, you know, to have uh, it tangible in their hands. And that totally is not even faith. Uh, you know, uh, so it just was always interesting that whenever we would discuss religion, we always came back to the the issue of where does Jesus fit into the picture? Yeah. Uh, you know, because they would argue, well, how could God create a perfect world and allow sin? Well, they would get down that debate and then there'd be debates back and forth. But eventually someone would have to come around to to the, the realization of of, you know, what would. What would happen? I remember one of the other debates we had was if Jesus lived to a ripe old age, would Christianity have survived? <laughs> and, and everybody in the group was like, well, I could have survived. It, 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 yeah, it, it, yeah. And I'm thinking it couldn't have. <laughs> it it, it, the, the message is gone. The, the whole purpose <laughs> yeah. of why he came isn't there. You know, so, I mean, there were always kinds of different debates we'd have. And I purposely pulled a religion one in there with some secular idea. Uh, because it was interesting to see how, you know, a lot of the students that I had were very Sunday schooled, but that's about it. You know, uh, I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to go into the the depths of, 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 of theology of what it is, what is the clear line that separates Christianity from the rest of the other religions. I think John MacArthur said in a, an interview with Larry King uh, back way back when, you know, he says there's two religions in the world. (laughs) There's the religion uh, where you have to do works and deeds to win your salvation. And then there's the one that has the redemptive power of Christ and you do nothing. He has already done it for you. He says, so it doesn't matter if we have Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, and we go on with the list and list and list. He says, we've got two religions in the world, one that's works-based and one that is redemptive-based. And, and, and I mean, the centrality of the whole message of of Christianity is that redemptive based um, uh, example that Christ set for us. Yeah, and, and that's uh, you know the, the woke movement. Uh, that's one of the things that it leaves out is it it points out victims, but never any way to bring justice. There's no there's no hope because how do you bring justice to people who are already dead and you know in situations that you can't re- reverse and 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 Christianity is the only uh, faith out there that says uh, uh, you can get a new start. You know, you can be forgiven. Yeah. So well, see, in, it's in unique. Our, in our anger and our willingness to not forgive, we have the power. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times, I know I find it sometimes in myself, you know, when you have your arguments with your spouses or you have an argument with a friend or something, it's like, well, I don't need to forgive you right now because now I'm in control of the situation. I have the power at the moment. You know, it's it's like I'm ready to do the checkmate. Um, so I think a lot of times culture refuses to just forgive and move on. Not that there are things we should forgive and forget. I mean, slavery, uh, the Atlantic slave trade was horrible, an abomination. It was totally against scripture, even though people utilize scripture to support their reasoning. It is just something that is a, definitely a, a dark stain uh, on the history books for for Europeans in general and Americans and so forth. But there has to come a point in time where we make that conscious decision to allow our bitterness and our anger for what was done to us in the past continue. And if we do that, we've got control of the situation. We can control it. We can have those crazy talks with ourselves in our minds. and Or we come to the point where we, you know what, we're going to surrender that ability to have control of it. We're going to do the toughest thing and actually forgive them and even go a step further as if you were to be really biblical and pray that they get saved. You know, the last time, the last thing you usually want somebody who's hurt you or wronged you in your (laughs) life is to be in heaven with you. It's like, why in the world would you do that? God, that makes no sense. Let them burn, let them crisp. No, but the reality (laughs) is he wants all to, to receive him, all to come unto him. And we have to come to that point. I mean, there have been people who've hurt me over the years, badly hurt me uh, over the years that I've had to 
countless times go to the altar and, and pray and talk it through with God and talk it through my mind and with others that I know they wronged me and what they did was wrong. And I really, it, if I were to take control of the situation and justifiably within myself, I probably have every human right to be angry, bitter, and mad. But there has to come a point that if I want to experience the love and forgiveness of Christ, at some point, I need to let that go. It, it I don't think anger and feelings when something's really happened to you, those raw feelings right away. I don't think there's anything wrong with having those because we're human. We're processing it. It's what we do. Are we then going to take control and be God in the situation? Because I got the control. Or are we going to give it to Jesus and say, you know what? It's too much for me to bear because it's going to just create more of an issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to represent Christ in this situation. And sometimes I feel when I'm on the show, I'm preaching to myself. So I'll take <laughs> it. I'll say amen to me right there, you know, because the reality is that that's, that's true. I mean, that's true freedom when you can just forgive and move on. And I know as humans, we have a really hard time doing that. And, and I think that's one of the problems with the woke movement with the Black Lives Matters movements and all of these other uh, social push movements that we're going to get our way and we're going to do what we want. And this is it. You, you owe us, you owe us, you owe us. Let me tell you what all of us owe and all of us deserve is <laughs> death and hell and the grave. And it's only through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his redemptive uh, act of go dying on the cross that we even have the ability to get to heaven. And I think, you know, I think that's just the key. We've got to learn to, to move beyond the, I'm going to harbor those bitter, bitter uh, feelings from 200 years ago. I mean, they're, they're wanting to pay people $1.3 million in California for anyone who's a descendant of, of uh, the Atlantic slave trade. Um, that if you, you want to be honest, that is every African-American that exists in this country. That's how they got here was through the Atlantic slave. And that's that doesn't make sense. I mean, what are we going to do to the Native Americans who we took their land and literally killed them? I mean, we've got Irish slaves. Yeah, yeah we've got your your Italians. Uh, I mean, yep. the, the list goes on. Um, right. You know, I'm, I'm a I'm a Christian and I feel like my rights are being violated every time I'm forced <laughs> to go to a diversity, equity and inclusion training. Because you can't sit there and really speak your mind. You just got to sit there and let them trot, give their indoctrination of, of goofiness, and you just check off the box and move on. I mean, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to go out and be racist and things like that. <laughs> but, you know, I don't have to accept every lifestyle that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the justice thing is, is important because um, – what people say they want is justice, but but justice is a God thing. That's, we can't we can't fix justice, and so when we won't let it go, you said it I think very clearly there. What we have is a God complex. I want to make justice, and I can't do that. That's outside my power. And one of the things I was told one time is when you forgive, what you're doing is not letting them get off the hook or get away with it, but you're letting God be God. God mm -hmm. handles justice. You're you're saying that's not my problem now. I'm yeah. going to forgive them. That transfers justice to God. They have to answer to God. Yeah. And God can forgive them then too and provide true justice. But um they can I believe, you know, Corey Ten Boom talks about that. She uh, uh did a uh a message and she said she uh, met one of the uh, Nazi captors that was responsible for her sister's death. And he said, I've become a Christian. I would like your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And she said, I couldn't do it. She said, I looked at him and it just I, everything came back. And she said, I finally realized that my, my soul was in danger. God says, uh, you know, if you don't forgive him, how can I forgive you? Uh, and, and she said, I can't forgive him, God. Can you forgive him through me? Let God be God, mm -hmm. you know. And, I think and the, he did, you know, and she think, could then embrace him and yeah. say, you're my brother. <laughs> I, I think one of the greatest acts of forgiveness I've seen by human race um, has been uh, the nickel mines shooting that happened 15 years ago down in Lancaster County. And that guy who, uh, I don't know, his milk milk delivery guy, and he went to that Amish schoolhouse and sent all the boys away and then basically – killed and mutilated, whatever. And and the fact that the, that group of Amish people, they had a reconciliation 
um, time together where the wife came and the just the forgiveness. And I think my wife was there at, at that. She was doing her internship and counseling at that at that point in time. In fact, she was called down the night it all happened. And she talks about, you know, you're going down and you're in a national, <laughs> a national news event and there's helicopters and lights flying on you. And you, you go in and you, she was just doing more observation stuff, but you know, that is a great act of forgiveness and, 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 and the media and, and the people in this country still, you know, when you bring that up still, some of them will say, I just don't know how those people could forgive that guy or forgive his family. And even though the family had nothing to do, with it, I don't know how they could just, because it's, that's the, it's that godness within us that realizes that it's not our job to 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 judge them it's not our job to seek the justice like you say it's it's a god thing that does that we need to be able to heal and the best way we can heal a lot of times is by going through the process of just forgiving that person um i mean sometimes it's scary to say well i, I hope i see that person that messed me over in heaven but <laughs> but the reality is jesus loves them just as much as he loves me. And, um, and that's a challenge. In God's, in God's sight, we're, we're all. Yeah. You know, when he looks at us and sees our sin, it's mm -hmm. so foreign to him that we, you know, the, again, the message says we're all in the same sinking boat. And so what we, we, we take evil and break it out into uh, relative evilnesses, but from God's point of view, we're all evil and, yeah. uh, we all need, yeah. uh, forgiveness and we're all in the same sinking boat and so yeah. um and, and and one one of the things that's important is we go through this evangelism stuff is uh i talk about what holds us back from telling people and, and there are two things one either somebody's too bad or somebody's too good you know we look at people and say well they don't need to know the gospel they're too good we don't understand sin we don't understand uh where we stand in god's sight and so uh, I think we have to get that in our understanding in our mm -hmm. head. Uh, basically, everybody has spiritual cancer, yeah. and we've been given the cure for spiritual cancer. Yeah. But the, the main reason we don't do it is out of fear. Uh, I, I, I write all the different fears down, and, and, and again, I don't have the time to go through them. But um, uh, one is that we, we, we don't really believe what we've just talked about. Uh, and universalism is the term for that. Everybody makes it somehow, but that, that violates the justice that we so desperately want, mm -hmm. and and so we have no hope of justice if if that's true. Um, the other thing is is fear of the situation. I'm afraid to speak, and uh, I, I, this is in the Bible. It's been there forever, and I just saw it here a few years ago. But the Apostle Paul says in First Corinthians two one through five, I spoke. When I was with you in fear and trembling, the mm -hmm. apostle Paul was afraid to speak, but he did it and people responded. And he says it was to your benefit because you can't uh, attribute it to my craftiness or good speaking. It was God's power. I so remember you telling a story last time when we had met that you had uh, done something with a gentleman, I think at one of the park things, some evangelism thing uh, with a guy at one of the parks and he had one person had gotten saved or something that when you were with him yep. and he was just wanting to go back and do more and wanting to go back and do more. But yet he was so scared to take, take that first step that once he did it, it was like, Oh, right. I, I need more. I need more. You're like, not right now. Not right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when you, when you see God work supernaturally and again, getting back to the, well, I don't want to go back to the apologetics because we can talk all day on that, but, 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 but God is a supernatural God. He's outside of nature. He's in nature too, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's a supernatural influence. that doesn't, uh, he created the universe so he doesn't have to live within the universe's power and rules. He can do miracles. He can whatever. So once you've seen God supernaturally change somebody like the Apostle Paul or me or somebody, uh, it, it does things to you. It's like, this is really true, and I want other people to. So so it's a motivational thing, too. Um, one of the funniest things I've run into with fear is, am I allowed to do this? Well, why wouldn't you? What pastor would tell you not to tell people about Jesus? But laity have this fear 
uh, that they're not allowed to do anything without certifications and permission. And and Jesus said to do it. I figure if he says to do it, we should be okay. You know, you just go do it. You they know, weren't okay. licensing the disciples <laughs> no. back then. You didn't no. have to send your money away and get your certificate to hang on a wall. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we did a thing one time. I was trying to get more house churches going. And one of the problems is, is I strongly believe there's a dichotomy uh, in in this kind of thing where evangelists are the birthing process and pastors are part of the discipling process. And so I needed pastors. I needed shepherds to shepherd the groups. And we did a steak dinner, invited all the certified lay speakers and certified lay ministers in and said, hey, go out and you know we'll, we'll help you start a group and you run the group. And without exception, 32 people said, are we allowed to do this? <laughs> It's like, okay, you know, you can't meet together with friends and talk about Jesus or what, you know? And so, so it's a real problem and, yeah. and, and, and lay people need to be motivated to go out and try something, do something. Well, if I do it, what if I fail? There's a fear of failure, but we're never told to be successful. We're just told to be obedient, go to it. Yeah. It's up to God to bring the results. So yeah. I don't have to worry about that. One of them is what if I'm all alone? Well, there's a verse we often quote that I think we do it disjustice. And uh, Jesus says, I will be with you until the end of the age. But if you back up at the beginning of that verse, it says, as you are doing this, I will be with you. Uh, as you're out there, you're not alone. I will be with you as you're doing my work. So you're not alone. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, well, what will people think? I always take that fear. Um, I always ask, uh, and when I teach this, uh, who who is the strangest person in the Bible? Almost always it comes back to John the Baptist, you know. Yeah. Um and, Eats and locusts. Uh, yeah, hangs out I in mean, the desert. We wouldn't let him in our church. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely <laughs> not. And yet Jesus said, What's he say about him? Of all the prophets, John was the greatest. So I like you to like me, but, but if Jesus likes me, you don't rank that eye. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay, but you know, um, I don't know what to say. Um uh, that's one of the things we'll touch here at the very end very quickly here is uh, there are ways to know what to say. Uh, and I told you last time about the woman who never said anything. And I, uh, she broke my heart. Spirit worked through her and broke my heart. But um, the book of Romans is Paul's treatise on the Christian faith. And I tell people, you can read the book of Romans in an hour. Um, and if you would read that once a week, take um, break Romans up into seven readings and read it once a week for 52 weeks. The whole gospel was in there and we call it the Romans road. Uh, you don't have to worry. I mean, it will come alive to you. You'll be able to answer questions, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then um, one of the fears is I'm too old. And uh, I, I love this one because I have a friend, Donna Jensen, that's in her 80s, and uh, she wrote a letter to a group of witches and saying, hey, you guys, God loves you, and he would like you to trust him, and you don't have to worry about your future. And, and man, I'd be afraid to do some of this stuff she's doing, you know, 80-some <laughs> years old, and she's learned how to do Facebook, and she's talking to um, prostitutes down in Pittsburgh on Facebook, telling them about Jesus and stuff. You're never too old. You might have to change the way you do it, but not that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people might respond to all this uh you know this this is a scary way to do church i don't know if i feel comfortable doing this and i always uh, give out a little book called the uh, barbarian way by erwin raphael mcmanus uh, who challenges us he says we are barbarians we are people from outside this culture we are strangers and sojourners in this world we're dual citizens we, we belong here but we really don't we really belong in the kingdom of heaven and we're barbarians here we're invaders are coming into this world trying to change people to our culture mm -hmm. of the kingdom of god and yeah. and so uh if we live as barbarians uh it will help us get through some of this stuff and then one of probably the last fear i'm going to talk about right now is uh, cultural differences uh tony Campolo talks about this it's really kind of cute how he says it uh, uh, he went to a church in philadelphia and he says and then one of those families moved in he says and one of our families moved out. He says, and then more of their families moved in and more of our families moved out. He said, and I was the only one left. It was like us, he said, because my granddaddy dedicated to Pew and I couldn't leave. You know, <laughs> And he was joking, but, but culture, we, we have this thing about our, our quote church that we want it to be comfortable. We want people to be like us. And when you are fishers of men, we talked about the discipleship process. 
um, I do a message where I talk about this and I bring a, a bluegill. Uh, in the summer, it's freshly caught. Uh, I take one out of the freezer I keep there for this message, if not. And they are slimy and stinky and they squirm and they got barbs in their back and they don't like being cleaned. And, and, and we don't like fish like that. And then I hold up a uh, McDonald's square patty with breading on it. That's how we like our fish in church, okay? <laughs> but that's not how it works. You know, Ooh, I don't like church... either one of those fish. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they would have went with the pineapple and cheese years ago <laughs> right. instead of the fish, whatever they call that. <laughs> but but the church is an organism, yeah. and it's a living relational organism. It's the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and and people, when they are babes in Christ, the Bible talks about that. Uh, they're babies, and they don't know all the social etiquettes, and they don't know all the politeness, and they don't know the words yet. And they eat, and when they eat, they do funny things in their diapers, and it's not nice. It's not messy, you know. And yeah. Church is an organism. It's messy. And yeah. we struggle against that. And I understand the struggle. I feel it myself. But we're called to build a church of everybody who will come, anybody mm -hmm. who will listen. So the fear of cultural differences, we have to overcome that somehow. So I'm going to talk about tools next. I'll stop and let you talk for a second. <laughs> no, I, I just, um, I'm just, you know, the, the whole, the, the, th the thing that was, interesting as we always have in our mind well this person's too bad i've never quite thought of the this person's too good yeah. uh you know well, they do good they do good you know i, I think there's this we, we've just lost we've lost touch with the reality of of who christ is mm -hmm. over over the last 40 50 years and um, who we are <laughs> and who we are and who yeah. we're supposed to be um you know we're having an identity crisis here in america in many ways uh, physically, we have a major identity crisis when it comes spiritually uh, to to this nation. Even within Christianity, there's the you know the whole I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm a Christian. I've read my Bible. I go Christ. I'm a Christer. You know, we were joking around on Sunday saying, um, "Man, I wish we'd see this many people here on a Sunday morning." And one of the other guys says, "Yeah, right. They'll never get out of bed this early again." You know, I mean, it was packed packed uh and i don't know what the first service was but i know it was packed and i'm just thinking man it'd be nice to you know have people have a desire to want to go to church beyond just oh let's check our punch card and we did our thing for the year and now we'll come back at christmas um so but i've never really thought of it that way the the good and and the bad and uh, you know just too good too too bad but you keep, keep we, we define yeah. we define good and bad based on our understanding of good and bad not God's understanding and and uh, John Ortberg in his uh, book uh, I think it was if you want to walk on water you have to get out of the boat talks about that he was in a a uh, laundromat and uh, he was talking to an older lady and and asked her if she knew she'd go to heaven and she said yeah and he says why he says well I'm a pretty good person he says well um you know how do you know you're a good person? Well, she says, well, I try to obey the Ten Commandments. He says, ma'am, can you, you even name them? She goes, no, but I'm sure as hell sure I never broke any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. we, 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 we define what's good and evil based on what makes me happy, not what a God says is right or wrong. Right. And if he made us, we talked about creation. If God created us, he, when you create a machine as an engineer, you get to define when it's working right and when it's not, yeah. not the machine. But we, the machines, have rebelled and said, it's all about me. It's not about you. Yeah. Um, now, it was something I want in, in that thought, um, I had a friend, uh, we were talking about cults and we were talking about other religions and, and, and uh, people that are atheists and stuff. And I have a friend, uh, Joy Curavilla, who approaches that. Uh, from an, a very interesting point, uh, when he talks to somebody, uh, as he listens to them describe what they believe, he listens for things like, oh, I can see you talk about justice. You know, justice is a part of, of God's kingdom, and that's important. But how you get true justice is, and then he brings them over there. Or I see that you care about eternity, or I see that you care about fairness, or you, you know, whatever love. Or, but he always takes something there, uh, in in a way that helps pull them into the talk 
rather than push him away from the talk. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I've tried to, to mirror that. And I thank him for that, uh, that wisdom to help me do that. And so, um, as you struggle with evangelism, struggle with trying to find where somebody's got something that's a lofty idea that you can build on. That's part of God's kingdom that you can applaud them for. And then like, um, I think it was Priscilla and Aquila where they taught the guy uh, the way more correctly. You know, you mm -hmm. can, you can take them from that point then and move them towards the Christian kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I'll, I'll cover if, if it's all right is uh, yeah. tools and uh, uh, tools are interesting because um, the gospel is pretty simple and pretty clear. The bulk of the problem is, learning how to open up conversations. We were talking about t-shirts a little while ago and, and how to uh, not get sidetracked down rabbit trails or not get pulled into things where they're just trying to distract you or whatever. There's, there are tools to help you work through that stuff. A tool in and of itself uh, can be plastic if it's not used right, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be very, very helpful uh, helping you get the message across without, you know, having problems. Um, some tools are very simple. Uh, there was a lay evangelist, Harry Denman. Uh, there's a, a Harry Denman Evangelism Award that was given in his honor. Uh, the man uh, was a genius at starting conversations. Harry never wore a watch. And invariably, whenever he was alone with somebody in an elevator or whatever, a uh, waitress, he would say, hey, can you tell me what time it is? And that gave him the excuse to start the conversation. And they mm -hmm. say, you know, well, it's 2.30. Wow, it's amazing how time flies. Have you ever thought about time? Have you ever considered eternity? And, you know, the man led wow. all kinds of people to the Lord by not wearing a watch, you know. So um, sometimes you have to find a tool that works for you. Um, um, one of the first tools, and this one, really, I hate to admit this, but this really became the the first tool in my repertoire of tools. Um, when I read a book by... Um, Dennis Kinlaw called uh, prayer lifting them up as Jesus did bearing the world as Jesus did. And uh, he said two things in there uh, that were fascinating. Uh, one was the, what he calls the mediatorial prayer of Jesus in John 17, where Jesus prays for the disciples, but he doesn't stop there. Then he goes on and prays for those that the disciples would reach. And he suggests, and, and I've been playing with this a little bit with people I talk to, uh, you know, how did, how did you get saved? Who, who, uh, who prayed for you? And almost everybody I talk to will say, well, grandma was praying for me or um, my mother or uh, the pastor or the youth group leader or on and on and on it goes. Uh, and what he suggests is that everybody who has become a Christian has become a Christian through the efforts of another Christian. And that mediatorial principle uh, is what does it. He he talks about uh, Abraham. I, we might have talked about this last time. I can't remember. Abraham at the uh, uh, Oaks of Mamre, where uh, the uh, supernatural intervention uh, after he fed them and they were get, getting ready to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, shall I hide this thing I'm going to do? And uh, it was a rhetorical question. He told Abraham, I'm going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and I've got to destroy them because of the evil that's rising up out of them. And then uh, Dennis Kinlaw says in the Hebrew, there's a pregnant pause there. Uh, and, and basically, the Hebrews are saying that God's saying, do you care enough about these people to intervene for them? And he's mm -hmm. waiting. And then Abraham does his, hey, if there's 50 people, well, what about 45? And you know, he negotiates with God, and God is more than happy when somebody intervenes and cares about people to respond to those prayers of mediation. Yeah. And so in evangelism, I am thoroughly convinced of that to do effective evangelism, that mediatory of prayer, uh, caring enough about somebody to stand between them and God's justice mm -hmm. and say, God, help me help them. You know, yeah. help me help them find your grace and mercy, you know, help somebody talk to them if it's not me, you know? So, yeah. um, so I, I put that as the first tool in, 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 in the bucket. Um, and then um, first Peter three fifteen says, always be ready to give an account of the hope that's within you. And so part of that is, I believe reading scripture and understanding it, just not reading it to check it off. 
but to start to have it sink into your soul. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll never forget. I, I memorized verses. Uh, there was a guy from uh, Liberty University, an evangelist, that uh, convinced us to uh, memorize verses. And I had a boring job, and I would sit, and I had three by five cards with verses on them, and I would say them over and over again, try to do five a week. I had a stack of about three or four inches high. And I'll never forget, as long as I live, uh, Revelation 20, 14, and 15, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And I was saying that over and over again for over two hours, trying to memorize the whole thing. And all of a sudden, I sat back on my chair, and I said, whoa, is that true? You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It just, the reality of it, it wasn't just verse, it wasn't something I memorized, but the concept that there is a judgment and there is a reckoning of justice where God condemns evil and, and judges it. And yeah. it's like, oh, my goodness. So as we read scripture, I think that's what we need to work towards is that it becomes a part of our heart and soul, not just a part of our head. Mm-hmm. And it changes the way we look at people and their needs. Um, more practical tools, if I could. I, I use a tool called Evangelism Explosion. It it's, uh, comes from a Presbyterian minister in Florida, Dr. D. James Kennedy. Uh, talks about two questions. I have a little black what onyx. A, what a powerful man of God he oh was. Oh, my, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I have a black onyx uh, lapel pin with two gold question marks. And uh, some fool eventually always look at them and say, what's the two question marks? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, but it will take you through an outline again can be very plastic if you just use it for that but it can help you if they do this then you can respond this way if they do that you can go this way and it will help you not be afraid because i don't know what to say or do yeah and it'll give you enough confidence that no matter what they throw at you well i can deal with it it's okay you know so ee is a powerful oh. tool well that's uh, the, Roman, the, the the interesting thing i think we were talking about before the show here was um you know, I had a conversation with a buddy of mine and he had said, you know, uh, if you guys ever decide to, dis- to, to uh, do T-shirts, because I'm thinking we'll just do shirts with the logo on it. You know, Woo-hoo, that's good. Great. And, and dandy. He says, do something that uh, is like I can use as a, a tool to talk. So I started mm-hmm. stewing in my brain and I came up with the Evangelism Series T-shirts. We just uh, <laughs> did one with the uh, like uh, like I was mentioning to you, the um, uh, Skull and Crossbones. um And uh, normally it would say, you know, dead men tell no lies, but we put dead men have no rights, Galatians (laughs) 2.20. And, you know, there's a whole series of things, but I was like, that's not a bad idea. Why not have an item that you're wearing that somebody might say, wait, wait, isn't that supposed to say this? (laughs) Well, yes, but this is what it means. And then you use the Galatians 2.20 reference that I am uh, crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And and just talk about uh, the, the fact that we're dead men, you know, or dead people to our uh, dead to our sin and alive in Christ. And so, so I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, and uh, it seems so these things are starting to take off. I remember you were telling me about the one that you, you had done years ago and, <laughs> but, but it is, it's great, great starters and you can, you can have it so that it's, it, it goes one way. And especially, you know, with the whole Galatians 2.20, you could probably, come up with a few different ways a conversation could go and then yeah. when you encounter that individual or that person says that's a really cool shirt what's it mean uh you can explain uh, and and even use you know whether you're you can use the intellectual or testimonial uh maybe the right. direct and confrontational style of evangelism to right. to or invita- invitate whatever you could use any of them and and to get uh somebody to to understand that uh what what's represented on that shirt is more than just a message that's being said. It's it's a, a reality that's not only within our heart, but with within time that exists today, like then here and now. Yeah. Yeah. In our culture, the hardest thing is starting the conversation. People are interested in spiritual things, not necessarily Christianity. That's our job is to convince them that this is the answer to their spiritual questions. But the hardest thing is to get the conversation going. I'd mentioned to you that one of the ones, uh, I used to wear t-shirts like that a lot. And one of the most effective was in the Christian t-shirt. It just said, what is the speed of dark? And uh, uh, I was pumping gas and a guy Looked around the pump and says, "All right, I'll I'll bite. What's the speed of dark?" I said, "Speed doesn't uh, dark doesn't have a speed. Uh, light does, and you know, and and you, you know, light is. Uh, you know, the Bible says God is light, and you know, and it just went into a conversation right there at the gas pump. Um, so so finding 
ways to start the conversation. That goes back to, you know, uh, even I didn't know I could pitch like that. You find what works for you Mm -hmm. and then you follow it. You don't have to do it like me. You don't have to do it like Billy Graham. Just do something, you know, find a way and and use it. Um, Another tool is what we call the Romans road. You heard me at the beginning talk about that. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9 and 10. Uh, Romans is packed full of the gospel. It's a treatise of the Christian faith by Paul. Powerful tool. Uh, there's one uh, that's usually labeled the napkin evangelism. It uh, shows a gulf between two uh, pieces of land, and then there's a cross that bridges that. And that's Jesus' cross get you from earth to heaven. And uh, um, they show you how to draw that out and tell the story of the gospel. And it's a tool. That's all it is, is a tool. Um but to use any tool, and I'm going to end with this, uh, and then we'll talk whatever else you might before we stop. But um, I found a, a poem uh, just last week, and it talked about the gatekeeper. And the story was that the gatekeeper stood just outside the door where safety was. Everybody else ran into safety and got inside where they were good and safe. But the gatekeeper was concerned about those who might not find the door and might not get the safety and stood there encouraging them to come and come through the door. And that's the evangelist. That's the person who says, Mm. you know, somebody did this for me. I want to do it for somebody else. I want somebody else to find the door that I found. And so that, that, that's, you know, you tie that in with, I can do this and, and find some way to do something. Uh, you can get that book I told you about and, and read. You can take the assessment. Um, you can contact me on Facebook or, uh, you know, uh, some other form there, Messenger, and uh, I'll tell you more. I'll contact you with people who can. Uh, but but I really believe that evangelism is – we're seeing the death of Christianity because of a lack of emphasis on spiritual birth. Mm-hmm. And if it's the birthplace of discipleship, we can't make disciples without being born first. Mm-hmm. And so evangelism has to be revitalized. And, and 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 I believe again, I believe it's I believe pastors are shepherds. They're not they can have the gift of evangelism, but I believe that lay people are the people that need to be the evangelists. They're out there yeah. amongst the people and culture the most, and they need to learn how to do it and do it well. And yeah, faithful. and it's and it's plowing through through the uh the uh the muck of universalism and um everything you know, postmodernism and uh, post christian and gnosticism yeah. <laughs> and all the other isms that are out there that uh, people have and and coming to the the true uh reality of 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 christianity and and who jesus is and and what he has done for you yeah so but one other thing mike if i can if you got yeah. a second yeah go ahead. um i one of the thing about these six styles, if you think about it, uh, Billy Graham has, I think I might have talked about this last time too, but it's important. Um, he has a thing called My Hope where he shows a video with uh, uh, a couple testimonies. And then um, he he uses those testimonies and, and presents the gospel. And it's meant to do in a crowd. And I would uh, have you think about what would happen if the people serving would uh, create the meal uh, or the pizza or something at somebody's place and make it open for people to come. And then the invitational people would invite the people in. And then the relational people would meet them at the door and say, hey, come over and see Greg and Sally. I, you know, they got kids the same age as you. And then and then the testimonial when the video's done would say, hey, it happened to me too. Let me tell you what happened to me. The apologist would say, hey, if you've got questions, I can help you work through them if you yeah. really want to know. Yeah. And the last one, the confrontational said, hey, you've heard something today. You got a decision to make. Yeah. So all six styles can work together. And where you're weak, they're strong mm-hmm. and, and you can balance each other. And so uh, if, if you do this in a church, find those that aren't like you and work with them. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, totally. Uh, you know, Paul, I, I think. Thank you for coming on the show and, um, you know, sharing your heart, talking us through these these different styles and really the importance of what evangelism is and and what we need to do. I mean, we all have the ability to share what God has done in our lives. Just the fact that we are believers in Christ. You know, I used to have a buddy of mine who would say, "I could, I nothing ever happened. Nothing spectacular happened to me. I wasn't a former drug addict. I wasn't an atheist. I was, you know, I grew up in the church. 
And I accepted Christ as a, my savior at a young age. And I never really did any of that. And I said, well, then, you know, it's like, well, your testimony is that God protected you from all of those other things that the rest of the world and the rest of us might have encountered. I mean, and that's a testimony in and of itself. So sure. uh, just, plus, just, plus if, if, if everybody's a sinner, you were a sinner. Yeah. Maybe not as evil as others, but you were a sinner. Yep. Christ came into your life and saved you. And now you're a new creature in Christ. That's a yeah. testimony. There's nothing yeah, wrong with that. Totally. Totally. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us on the show again. Definitely have to have you uh, back. I know you <laughs> love book studies. Uh, rumor is out. Somebody, uh, a couple birdies told me that in my ear. So, uh, you know, think of a, another uh, type of book that you use that you uh, utilize, study, and have put some stuff together. And, uh, you know, let's, let's continue this. Uh, I think sure. this would be great. I love having you on the show. Um, I, I know everybody who's watched the first episode has has it's just been taken off. So I, I can't wait uh, to to see how this one goes. Uh, I'm Mike Beckett. Uh, thank you again for joining us uh, for this uh, episode of The Dead Prophet. Uh, and uh, continue to live your life out loud for Jesus Christ and be an authentic believer in Jesus Christ. And, and as we've gone off of today's thing, go out and start winning people to the Lord. Uh, have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Hi, Mike Beckett here from The Dead Prophet. You heard us talk about the uh, Evangelism Series t-shirts uh, in this recent episode here with Paul Morelli. Uh, we will be introducing new ones periodically uh, throughout the year as we move forward uh, in the uh, vision and mission of The Dead Prophet. Uh, the first one on there we talked about. The second one will be coming up here uh, shortly, probably in June. But feel free to go to our website check out uh, the shirts and the designs and feel free to purchase one. Also, if you decide to uh, become a monthly partner with us, we will send you a complimentary shirt uh, for uh, joining us in our membership and in our vision here as a thank you gift. Also, that information is uh, also on the website as well. Hope to talk to you soon. Have a great day.